<coughs> and acceleration fields, meaning um, there are three-dimensional sort of constructs and how they uh, change through space and time, okay? Um, let me let's see. Yeah, I've got I've got a, a an overview slide, and then we've got a couple of um, oops, a couple of uh, public service announcements to make here. All right, so let's do this. Okay, so <coughs> um, oops, I didn't I didn't correct this. Um, we're no longer in the Bernoulli equation, so now we're going to start essentially a new um, uh, a new uh, what do you call it, module in Canvas. So what you see at the top now is a new one that should get released right now. The only thing that will be in there is after class is done and we have the recording of the video of this uh, particular lecture, that'll go in there and then we'll keep adding to it. So this one, we're now getting into um, fluid kinematics. Okay, <clears throat> so what we see on the right is a, a sort of a visualization of um, flow, and I, I pulled this off of the internet from a, a group at Notre Dame um, that has this really interesting software that they've developed to, to try to show some of these fluid um, flow structures and so forth. And so today we're going to talk about the velocity field and the acceleration field. On Thursday, we'll start to talk a little bit more about a systems and control volume approach to fluid mechanics, where we have to now think about things going in and out um, of uh, control volumes and so forth. And then we'll eventually get to proving um, the Reynolds transport theorem, which is kind of a fundamental basis for thinking about conservation laws when it comes to fluid mechanics. Um, announcements. So uh, I've got two just comments on um, uh, homework uh, approaches uh, that I'll, I'll show in the next two slides. And then don't forget that we've got homework seven um, due on Thursday at the beginning of class. Um, and so let me see. So let me, the, the two public service announcements I had, this is, I just pulled this slide from yesterday, right? This was one that we um, worked through. Um, but I just wanted you to note, or wanted to note that when you're using the Bernoulli equation, um, please be sure to state your assumptions. And what we mean by that in particular, let me change the color of my uh, pen here. Not really. Okay, uh, I'll change it to blue, I guess. Um, just putting these, for example, at the locations where they occur um, is useful. So, for example, if you put, you know, Z1 equals this and Z equal, Z2 equals that, that's useful. That Those are your assumptions. But what we've noticed is that um, in working through the homework, sometimes there's an assumption that V equals zero at this point without actually explicitly stating that. So in other words, all of a sudden that term disappears from the Bernoulli equation and there's not an explanation of why. So just, if you could just take the extra step to identify um, you know, that you're making that assumption that V at one in this case is equal to zero, um, that would just kind of put a, a, a better wrapper on your entire um, homework process. And then secondly, um, I just wanted to note, <clears throat> um, this just kind of comes back. We're going to revise the way that the instructions for parts two and three of your homeworks look. So instead, they're going to have these bullets. And um, there was one little bit that was repetitive, but just the note, the stating your assumptions bit here. Okay, so that just kind of feeds back into that. Um, and then um, one thing that, that I noticed a little bit on the exam, but um, from the parts that I graded, but um, I, of course you guys were under a bit of stress, but there were times when, for example, um, you, one might use gamma when they should have used density and then when gamma gets used and it gets multiplied by G again, you basically, you end up being off by, you know, if you're working in English units, that's 32.2. If you're working in um, uh, SI units, you're off by a factor of 9.81, right? Almost 10 times. So I don't know if you would have caught it if you had written your units out, but that's the goal for, um, for trying to track your units through, <coughs> through the problems is that you would hopefully catch hey, wait a minute, I have pounds in here. Why am I multiplying it by another acceleration or something like that? So um, just as an FYI, okay? Um, 
I guess with those uh, preliminaries out of the way, I'm ready to jump into um, the lecture materials. We're going to start with a few videos, but are there any questions before we do that? Nope. Nope. No questions. Okay. Terrific. Um, okay. I need to go out of this because I, these, I ended up pulling these up through the, um, through the, uh, let's see, I guess I'll just do this through the, the book. Okay. <clears throat> so these three videos at the beginning of, um, the chapter four are helpful, I think, in showing us something about how these, um, these flow um, or, or velocity fields act. So let's start with this one. Um, I think it's gonna play automatically. Let's see what happens here. Doesn't seem, oh, I'm at the end, sorry. Okay, so this is a delta wing. So it looks like a triangle. We're looking at either the top or bottom of it. And there are little holes in this wing. And what you can see is that um, from each one of these holes, there are um, little bits of dye coming out. And so the fluid that's being released in those um, has, uh, you know, a distinguishable sort of what we're calling a streak line here. So the streak line is showing us how the velocities change in time and space as flow goes over or velocities, whatever velocity field we have around this wing, okay? <clears throat> and so you can see where they cross over, for example. Um, so those are going to be in different X, Y, or uh, Z planes, but you can see where they're crossing over, and basically we're seeing um, some structure of the turbulence, let's say, over this uh, particular um, wing. We also see this change in the white um, through time. You know, it looks like there is some sort of a, um, a gust that comes from left to right, um, and then they all kind of ex extinguish towards the end of this. All right, so this is this is one. Um, view of looking at these streak lines, but ultimately um, what we're going to get to in this particular chapter is the no notion that all of these have, you know, non-straight um, or perfectly straight um, uh, velocities to them, right? They're changing in in uh, X, Y, Z, and time. And, and so that's ultimately what we want to get. All right. Uh, hmm. Curious. I didn't want to see that again. Do that. Okay, let's look at the second one here. Now, in this case, we're looking at um, a, uh, a rotating side of a wing. You guys have worked with some of these problems already. And in this case, what you're seeing is how the uh, velocity distributions change through time, right, in space. So we could think about having a coordinate system that might be relative to this um, this wing edge, or we can just work with our kind of fixed Cartesian X, Y, and Z. But every one of these is a little arrow um, showing us uh, some intensity, right? The different colors are different velocity values. So we're looking at a complex 3D flow in two dimensions. <clears throat> so we've taken a slice of it. And as this rotates, you know, everything kind of works out fine. And, and then as it rotates, we start to see these big changes in the velocity structure, right? And so ultimately, you know, if we were all, um, let's say, uh, aspiring to become um, uh, aeronautical engineers, we might care more about the details of what's going on in, these, um, in this sort of quasi-wing system to, you know, be able to predict the distributions of pressure and energy um, along these wings, but but we're not going to worry about that here in this case necessarily, but it's just an example to show us how this full velocity field in two dimensions is changing as uh, air moves from left to right or whatever our fluid is, is moving from left to right over this obstruction. All right, third one real quick. Looks like... Now, this is a little bit different. You can see a bit of oscillation occurring. We're looking down on a flow that's moving from left to right. And you can imagine this like a, a bridge pier in a river underneath a, a bridge, right? And so the water is moving from left to right. It's coming around this obstruction. And then we're getting this temporal uh, and spatial variability in sort of instabilities that are generated um, just downstream or downflow of the... Um, <clears throat> 
of the structure in this case. And again, the, the uh, colors of the arrows are indicating the pattern of velocity structures. Their directions are indicated by the, the arrow direction. Okay, so we'll look at, watch this one more time. All right, so we won't necessarily work with anything quite this complicated, but let's let's just try to bite off a little piece of this and understand how um, these velocity and acceleration fields work. All right, so let me go back to my... Okay, so you can do advance from there. <coughs> okay, so with fluid kinematics, we have several objectives. I'm going to go into pen mode here. Let's go ahead and use blue again. <coughs> and the objectives are, one, we want to identify flow characteristics based on the velocity field. So something, uh, be able to, to quantify something about that velocity field. And we want to calculate streamlines and accelerations in the velocity field. Accelerations, remember, are the uh, derivative <clears throat> of our um, velocity fields. And then we want to introduce concepts of systems and control volume. So that's something we'll start on Thursday. So we're going to try to attack the first two parts of this um, early uh, today, and then we'll move into um, more of this Reynolds transport context uh, Thursday and, and early next week. So learn how to apply the Reynolds transport theorem and material derivative. And we'll talk a little bit about what that material derivative is um, next week. <coughs> okay. So in your notes, you have these um, three um, fields identified, and I'm going to write them out because I want us to pay close attention to the way in which they're structured. On the right-hand side, you can see that we have a velocity vector here, capital V, and it's got three components, right? It's got a U, a V, and a W component. And the U component is acting in the X direction, right? The Y component is acting, <coughs> pardon me, the V component is acting in the Y direction, and the W is acting in the Z direction, right? So those are like coefficients that we're just going to use to represent these three directions, and so these cardinal directions. And so this is not unlike um, probably what you've seen in physics before. We also have these three unit vectors, i hat, j hat, k hat. Those are working in the x, y, and z directions respectively as well. So a vector in the, um, the y direction um, would might be, I have a value v multiplied by the unit vector j hat. Okay, <clears throat> so v could be, um, v could be a, a constant value, or it could be a function, right? It could be something that depends on uh, time or or position. All right, so if we were to write, let's start maybe with the simplest and work our way up. So if we were working in one dimension, our velocity vector would be given as u, um, and we could do this in any of the three, but I'm just going to use the x direction. And we would define our velocity as some u value as a function of x and or time, so position and time, multiplied by the i hat unit vector, right? Because that's going in the x direction. If we were working in two dimensions, we would work in, <clears throat> in this case, we're going to make that x and y. Um, this is going to be u um, as a function of x, y, and time times the i hat unit vector plus v, this is a script v, so it's supposed to be the same as this guy over here, v, which is a function of x, y, and time, or could be, uh, times the j hat unit vector, okay? And then you can imagine this gets a little more complicated as we go into the three-dimensional flow, where now we're going to have u, v, and w. So we're going to end up with three components here, so v bar, um, our vector, is equal to u, but now u can be a function of x, y, z, and time. So we can kind of think about that as four dimensions, right? Three spatial dimensions in one time. Multiply that by the i hat unit vector, and then we have um, v as a potential function of x, y, z, and or time. 
times the j hat unit vector plus now w, the script w, as a function of x, y, z, and or time, multiplied by the k unit vector. Okay? So that's where those come from. And again, we could have written the two dimension to be like x and z or y and z. It doesn't have to be x and y necessarily. We often kind of use x as our, our one dimensional flow or representation. And then when we go up to two, we use x and y. And when we go to three, it's x, y, and z. But any of these can work, um, you know, in the, the lower dimensions. We, can, we just have to have only one or two of them represented as appropriate. Okay, so um, for steady flows, there's no time dependence, okay? So if we are, if any of, if we're given a representation of the velocity vector and for its components, i.e. The, the U right here, let's say, um, and that doesn't have time in it, then it is steady in that direction. There's no change with time. If we are given both of these and neither of them have a time component to them, in other words, u is just a function of x and or y, v is also a function of x or y, and t is not included, then we have steady flow, okay? So the steady flow component here is important only in that it is, um, it, it's related to whether there is a change in time or a function of time included somehow with our velocity field, right? If a 2D velocity field is known, streamlines can be calculated by realizing that the streamline slope, dy dx, must be equal to the tangent of the angle of the velocity vector with the x-axis. So it, it, that's just a, a fancier way of saying that if we have some curved flow path, right, some velocity field and it has some curvature to it, remember the tangent is going to be essentially the first derivative. Right at any point, the slope that we're going to have is a is can be drawn as a tangent, and we can um, calculate this dy dx. So dy dx in this case is equal to the ratio of v over u. So the the in this case the the y component of velocity over the x component of velocity. All right. So <clears throat> let's put that to use as we think a little bit about some um, a common problem. So <clears throat> we are going to have to start um, thinking more about our calculus and using uh, derivatives of fairly simple functions to try to make some, some points here about, about um, uh, how we deal with uh, these velocity uh, vectors. So two dimension, this is problem 4.4 from the end of your chapter. Um, a two-dimensional velocity field is given by u is equal to 1 plus y. So there's no t component in here at all. There's also no x component, right? So u is a function, um, yeah, u is just a function of y. And the other velocity component, v, is given as a constant. v is equal to 1, okay? So u is equal to 1 plus y, v is equal to 1. Super simple function, right? Or two functions, really. So determine the equation of the streamline <coughs> that passes, no, this should be passes, sorry, that passes through the origin and then uh, plot this uh, streamline on a graph. Okay, so let's do the math on this side and then I'll show you the plot on the next slide, all right? <coughs> so our two components here are u is equal to one plus y and v, we said, is equal to one. So um, the streamline is given by um, we said um, dy dx on the previous slide, right? Okay. <coughs> so dy dx is going to be equal to, we said, we defined V over U, which is equal to one over one plus Y, okay? 
So all we've done is just plugged in those two, um, substituted in those values. However, <coughs> um, we still need to work with this in some reasonable way. So we're going to integrate this. And what we would end up with is basically sort of this cross multiplication. I'm going to, I'm going to omit the middle here and work with D Y. Um, I'm going to integrate sort of like a cross multiply and divide here, essentially, or, uh, sorry, that's not the right way to do it. We're going to group the one plus Y and the D Y and then the D X on the other side. So this would be one plus Y D Y. Um, and we're going to take the integral of this. Is get, oops, that's supposed to be an integral sign is equal to the integral of um, essentially one time, uh, let me do it this way, one dx. Okay, now I overcomplicated that because I just wanted to point out that it's this numerator that we are um, multiplying by dx to essentially um, make equivalent here, all right, by grouping these. So when we do this, um, when we take this uh, um, uh, integral, we end up with y plus one half y squared is equal to x plus some constant of integration, right? Now, um, so c is constant. Um, if we put the streamline through, so this says passes through the origin, right? If it passes through the origin, we know that X and Y have to equal zero at the origin. So when we plug those in, of course, there's no other constants in this equation. So at the origin, C is going to be equal to zero, right? And so <clears throat> for this to pass through the origin, C has to equal zero. Um, let's see. So for, uh, for x equals zero, y equals zero, we know that c is equal to zero as well, okay? <clears throat> so our equation simplifies then to y plus one half y squared is equal to x. Um, so let me just show that on the next slide. Um, I'm just gonna rewrite that. Um, with the, the plot that would go through the origin. <clears throat> so our fundamental equation then comes down to um, x is equal to y plus one half y squared. And if we were to plot that, we would get this sort of, of a plot, right? It, it, it looks like a parabola here. And you can see that we're going right through um, the origin. Now, one of the things that you also note about this is that there are some arrows drawn on this plot. So why are the arrows drawn in that direction? And it turns out that we were given that the V component is equal to one. <clears throat> so because um, V is equal to one, um, we can show this direction on the streamline. In other words, the arrows are pointing in the direction of y increasing, right? Y is equal to one. So with the, I mean, this has a bigger x component to it clearly, but because y is equal to one and always has to be increasing at all points, um, or is a constant at all points, but but going in the positive direction, we can draw the arrows in the in the positive direction of y in this case. There's not a, a mystery about that, all right? Okay, so that's a simple way to sort of demonstrate that we could deal with uh, you know velocity fields when we are given. Uh, the U and the V um, in a two-dimensional flow system, all right? <clears throat> what happens if we go into the acceleration field? First of all, let's start with a real uh, a schematic that we want to 
understand fundamentally before we start talking about the acceleration field. Okay, so <clears throat> here's our origin down here. We have x, y, and z equal to zero. Note that our axes go in the x, y, and z directions. And then we have this r sub a um, ray or vector that goes out to this location where our little gray barrel there is sort of indicating the fluid parcel or particle that we're trying to track. Now that particle has been going along this sort of reddish flow path here, and you can see that it's got some curvature to it. <clears throat> but at this particular moment, we have some, you know, some ZA at time T, some XA position at time T, and some YA position at time T. So that's just telling us where we are in space. And you can see that if we were to back up, I don't know, let's maybe not give it a time component, but let's just say from a spatial perspective, if we moved back down to like this location, those would all be different values, right? The X, the Y, and the Z of T, each one of those um, with respect to time, those would all be different values, right? So this is a unique position for this particular time, right? And then we have our velocity vector. So the velocity vector here is a function of the location um, that we're at in time, all right? And you can see then that we have these three components indicated here as well. The, the U, A, the V, A, and the W, A, both of those are um, a function of X, Y, and Z, which is summarized by just that R, R sub A vector and time, all right? So, all of these can be changing in time in the three uh, directions in space. And by the way, this is Cartesian space, meaning that we're working in X, Y, and Z. The alternative would be like radial coordinates. If we were working in circular system, we could be working in radius away from a center if we wanted to instead. But let's stick with Cartesian. Okay, so this is the same image again, but I wanted this to, uh, while we have this, um, uh, this notation, so you've got this in your notes, our velocity vector um, at A is equal to this RA, uh, some function RA and time, right? So we have a position vector and a, um, and a time included here. And ultimately this breaks down to our XA of T, YA of T, Z, A of T. So in other words, we have included, we've, we've uh, injected time into each of these locations that are a function of time as well for our particle, right? So to get the acceleration A, um, A of A, it's going to be equal to the derivative of the velocity at point A with respect to time, right? We know that fundamentally from, from particle physics, that our velocity is a change in location with time. Our acceleration is a change in velocity with time, right? So it's the first derivative of, um, with, of velocity with respect to time. And we're going to use the chain rule to basically, um, of differentiation to figure out what this really means when we sort of work it all out into all of its components, right? So um, if we were working in a classroom, I write, might write all of this out, but essentially you have this in your notes as well, I believe. So uh, the chain rule provides us with, um, you know, this first step of dVA uh, dt is equal to, and now what we're going to do is break this down into um, a del VA del t, and then we have three spatial components. So del VA del x, so the x component, multiplied by del x a del t, which is basically u sub a, right? Here's v sub a, and here's w sub a. So what we end up with is uh, a change in the velocity vector with, with respect to y, the y direction, multiplied by this change in the, um, the y position with time. So this is the velocity, this is how that velocity component is changing in the y direction, right? So from a, a, a math perspective, these are useful um, uh, representations. To try to translate this into English, what we're saying is this is how um, 
this whole term is a product of um, the change in of this v vector in the z direction multiplied by the the um, change of position or the velocity that's occurring in the z direction as well, which we recall we started out with w as that particular um, coefficient. All right. <clears throat> okay, so. We can simplify this a little bit, right? We can just put in these representations. So we still have, um, you know, del V A del T, right? So there's still a temporal component to this. And then we have the spatial components multiplied by the sort of unit, the velocities going in those three directions. So here's the velocity component um, derivative in space with respect to Y, the velocity component uh, derivative in uh, z direction <clears throat> and then multiplied by um, the uh, coefficient acting in those directions. And since this is true for any particle, we can generalize this into a velocity field. <clears throat> All right, so A looks like this. Our, our acceleration is broken up into two pieces. First, there is a local acceleration, and that local acceleration is how the, velo the velocity vector v is changing in time. Whether it's if it's accelerating, you know, increasing speed, then this is positive. If it is decreasing speed, then it is negative. So it's decelerating. <clears throat> Plus, and then we have these three components for what we call the convective acceleration. Okay, so the convective acceleration includes these velocity components u, v, and w. The local acceleration only accounts for the overall um, vector change with time. All right. So two components for acceleration. And this is important. What we're going to do in another um, example problem is essentially work through um, the uh, a one dimensional version of this to try to predict the, the convective acceleration. Okay, so first let's look at the acceleration components. Um, we could also break down um, the, the acceleration in the x direction as being equal to del u del t plus u del u del x. I think this is something you have in your notes. Plus v del u del y plus W del U del Z, okay? Um, then the Y component of the acceleration can be represented as um, a del V del T plus U del V del X. So how is V changing in the X direction? Plus V del V del Y plus W del V del Z, okay? And then finally, the Z component of acceleration can be predicted with or calculated as del W del T, as you can expect, plus U del W del X plus V del W del Y plus W del W del Z. Okay. Someone has a question in the comments just to clarify the difference between the, <clears throat> excuse me, between the local and convective accelerations. Yeah. Okay. What, what's the, was that uh, just, just wanting more of a, a more of a description? Yeah, they're just they're asking what's the main differences. Yeah. Oh, oh okay, okay. So the con so convection. Um, you've probably heard of convective ovens. Convection is a word that we sometimes conflate with advection or movement, right? And so on the right hand side of this, the convective component or convective acceleration, those three terms are really looking at how um, each one of those is sort of weighting this change of the velocity vector in these spatial directions, 
Okay, so note that the, 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 what you're taking the partial derivative to for the convective acceleration is with respect to space. Space in the x direction, space in the y direction, space in the z direction. However, that sort of leaves out the potential for a temporal change. And so the local acceleration is all about um, having uh, a, a derivative with respect to time instead. So convective accelerations include these three velocities or convective uh, components, and then the local acceleration is just the overall vector change with time. Okay, and then I think you've got this in your notes. What I want to do next is convert this all to apply it somehow and think about what it means when, when we're asked to... Um, the challenge to do this, and we're just going to use a one-dimensional system. So we're going to make this fairly simple. This is um, problem 4.26 from the end of your, your chapter. So um, we're given basically this expansion section within a, um, a, a pipe system, closed system, and um, you can see that we're given a capital V1 here. This is not necessarily a vector, but what we're going to do is convert that to a U at one, right? So we're going to work in, we're going to call the X direction going this way, right? And we're going to um, have these two different velocities. So with respect to time, we get four T feet per second at location number one. And then we have a different velocity at point number two, right? Now, before we go any further, we expect, we should expect some kind of negative acceleration here, right? In other words, because the cross section is expanding, our velocity needs to decrease. And, and we're told as much, right? 4t feet per second is twice as much as 2t feet per second, right? So if, if t is 5, then this is 20 feet per second, and this is 10 feet per second. So we're always at half of the velocity on this right on the at point number two than we have at point number one. And therefore, velocity with time and perhaps with space, we expect to be decreasing somehow. So a negative acceleration. All right. So I'm gleaning that without even reading anything about the problem just yet. I'm just sort of trying to interpret what's going on here in this system. All right. Okay, so the problem statement is the velocity of air in the diverging pipe shown below is given by V equals one, uh, sorry, V1 is equal to T, 4T feet per second, and V2 is equal to 2T feet per second, where T is the time in seconds. Determine the local accelerations at, at points one and two is part A, and then part two, is, or part B, is to average the convective acceleration between these two points, is that negative, zero, or positive? So we could expect, and then the question is why? So part B we're going to expect is negative, um, and we'll, we'll talk about why that's the case, or we'll prove the why part of that in a moment. Um, first of all, we're looking for the local acceleration um, at points one and two. So how is is in this case, we're given these Vs. I'm going to convert those to Us just to indicate that we're working in a one-dimensional system. So how is, so part A is basically solving for del U del T at one and del U del T at point number two. Okay, so we're just going to take the derivatives of those to figure out those um, accelerations, right? Um, so let's go ahead and do um, at one del u del t at one is equal to uh, the partial of four t with respect to t, which is equal to four. It comes out to four essentially four feet per second squared, right? Um, gives us that um, acceleration, and then. Um, del u del t oops, at point number two is the same thing we have del now of 2t 
um, del T and we come out with two feet per second squared. Okay, so very straightforward on this calculus, um, pretty easy. Now what we need to do is figure out this convective acceleration, which is slightly different. So real quick, just to go back. So somebody had asked this question. All we did was look at the temporal component of the change in U, the velocity we had, um, in a one-dimensional system to figure out the local acceleration. When we come to the, the next part B, with the, essentially the convective acceleration, we're just looking at one term because we only have one dimensional flow, okay? So our one dimensional velocity now, I'm gonna do this on the next slide. Part B, we have that the convective acceleration is, um, or I guess I'll say is equal to um, U, that's supposed to be U, del u del x right so how is we multiply by u how u is changing in the x direction okay so in all cases u is greater than zero <clears throat> and um at any time t um, V2 is less than V1, right? So, uh, so between uh, point number one and point number two, we end up with del U del X being approximated Oh, come on now. Approximated by V2 minus V1 over some length L. And because V2 is smaller than V1, we know that this has to end up being less than zero. So that was kind of the reasoning that I gave in words before we read the problem statement, right? That ultimately 4T is always going to be greater than 2T um, and and uh, our fluid is going from point number one at 4t to point number two at, at 2t, all right? So, hence, um, we would expect u del u del x to be less than zero, um, or we can say the average acceleration, uh, convective acceleration, is negative. It's we're, we're slowing down the flow, the velocity. Okay. All right. Um, I forgot to start our reef app. So the next things that I have are a series of reef questions that I want us to um, talk our way through um, and get your input on them. And we'll put, we're gonna end up putting some of this um, new knowledge to practice with um, a one dimensional system, all right? So let me let me get out of this real quick, out of PowerPoint real quick, just to launch the Reef app and get the class started. Apologies for that. Keep this. And, oh, that's part of the reason it disappeared from my My toolbar, there it is. I clicker cloud. Do, 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 do. Okay, it's starting up and start class. Okay, so now we're, we've got our, our I clicker app going. Okay, so here's our first one. Here is the velocity that is given. We have, um, now we have a one dimensional 
uh, velocity that is acting in the y direction. Okay, and the reason we know that is because we have the j unit vector included here. So suppose the velocity vector v is, is in a velocity field is given by v is equal to 6x um, j, uh, the unit vector j, right? So the question here is, of these four, is this a one-dimensional flow in the x direction, a one-dimensional flow in the y direction, two-dimensional flow in the y direction, or two-dimensional flow in the x direction? And I feel like um, I may have given that away when I started describing this. So, so go ahead and uh, answer this question. We've got a couple more built on this, but we're going to start with this. Sixty-four. Let's see how many do we have online. We have ninety-seven online today, so we should get about ninety-four responses. Got twenty more seconds. We got three more of these questions to go through, but again, this is just we'll just build our knowledge here a little bit. Up to ninety. Going once, going twice. Give you a couple more seconds here. We'll go to 110. Any others? Okay, looks like we're gonna end there. All right, so stop there. And <clears throat> we had two votes for A, uh, 64 votes for B, um, 22 votes for C, and three votes for D. Okay, good, and no one chose E, which is always a wild card. Um, someone may do that. All right. So in this case, um, the correct answer is in fact B. And the reason we know this, oops. Oh, I'm in. I'm in that mode. Oops. Sorry. Let me go back. Okay. So the reason we know this is that we're given the J unit vector, and the J is acting in the y direction. We're we're not given any information about an I or K. So it's one dimensional and it happens to be in the y direction. So this is the right answer. Um, good on you, uh, 64 of you. And um, with respect to, I can see where you might want to assume that it's two dimensional for anybody who chose C or D. And the reason that it's not is only because we're not given any information about a, 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 another direction. It could be whether it's X or Z, we're not given any information. Um, so just because Y is often the second dimension we care about, um, we actually have to have information about X or Z to say that it's a two-dimensional flow. Um, so in this case, this is a, a one-dimensional velocity. Okay, um, let me put that away. Go to the next one. <clears throat> okay, so now we have the same vector. The question is, is this flow steady? <clears throat> uh, is it uh, possible only if it's compressible flow, meaning that... Uh, um, our density can change, or C, is it changing with time, All right? So with the information given, which one of these is true? Again, we're only defining this one-dimensional flow, Y direction. <coughs> so the question is, what do we know about its change in time? All right, we're up to 80. <clears throat> 83. Maybe I should get some actual uh, Jeopardy music to play. I can cue that up on my phone. All right, we're up to 87. I think that was about what we got to last time. So... 88, 91. All right, two more seconds. Nothing. Okay. All right, so let's take a look at the results. Um, 69 of you chose A, which is the correct answer. Um, we're not given, the reason that we know this is that we're not given any information about T, right? There's no, uh, our velocity is not a function of time at all. If it was a function of time, then we could say that it is 
accelerating or deaccelerating, you know, depending on whether it was a positive or negative value. But essentially, with 6xj, uh, the, the j vector, unit vector, 6x is essentially all the information we're given. So as we change in the x direction, we are increasing or decreasing the velocity amount but that has nothing to do with time in this case. Um, there's no there's no function of time. So A is the correct answer. <clears throat> and um, uh, there's no information about whether it's compressible or not, right? There's, we don't have anything um, indicating anything about uh, change in density or mass. So, so B would have been hard to reason out as well. All right, let's keep going. So our next one. Suppose the velocity vector v in a velocity field is given by our familiar equation here. At the point x, y, z equals 7, 10, 3, what is the magnitude of our velocity? All right, so we'll give you a minute. Um, I will only give you the hint that you do have to do a small amount of math to figure out the value. So is it 18 meters per second, four, tw uh, sorry, 42 meters per second, 60 meters per second, or 210 meters per second? <clears throat> and this is the absolute value, of course. So the magnitude of our velocity. Okay, we're up to 73. Perhaps some of our colleagues dropped off when we got to multiples here. 76, 87, good, good, 89. See if we can get back up to 92, that's good. Anyone else, 93? Okay, that looks pretty good. Let's stop it and take a look. Uh, 94, good, we squeezed in one more. All right, let's take a look. So we've got a couple of people that voted for 18 meters per second. Most everyone voted for 42 meters per second. We have 11 that voted for 60 meters per second and one person chose 210. Um, I'm not quite sure how you get to 210, I suppose. There's probably some way of doing it, but um, in this case, the majority is correct. B is the answer and the reason for that is that we're taking the X value here, oops, sorry. The X value here, which is seven, and plugging that in for x here. So 6 times 7 is 42, and that's how we get a value. Um, again, there's no information about any um, dependence on y or z, our, our positions, only x. And so 6 times that x value gives us this, um, this equation, this, or this um, uh, magnitude of 42 meters per second. Okay, um, do that. <clears throat> so B was the right answer. Um, I'm not in pen mode. Oh, let's go highlighter mode. B is our right answer. All right. <clears throat> this is the last one of these, I think. Yeah, okay. Given the following description of a flow field, so now we have three dimensions, right? We have a uh, three dimensional flow. We have in the I direction, we are dependent on X squared. In the J direction, we're dependent on Y squared times five. And then in the K direction, we're also um, uh, dependent on a square, in this case, Z squared multiplied by three, all right? So where the symbols are bold are vectors, which of the following is true? The flow is unsteady, flow is one dimensional, two dimensional, or three dimensional. Once again, I gave it away, my bad. If you weren't paying attention, you can read this now and figure out which one of these is the right answer. <clears throat> All right, we're doing this one pretty fast. 25, 26, so we're up to 85, 89. See if we can get back up to 94. 93, oh, 93, just a little further. All right, may I get the 94th person? Um, let's go ahead and cut it here. Ah, oh, there it is, coming right in, fantastic. All right, let's, we'll just go to the top of the minute. 
uh, just in case there's anybody lingering. Uh, okay. All right, let's take a look at the results. So as I had given it away, yes, indeed, D was the right answer that this flow is three-dimensional. Um, it's not unsteady because none of these have a function of T in them. Um, so it must be steady flow, but you can see that the velocity does change with X, Y, and Z location, all right? Um, and so the flow is three-dimensional because we have the I, J, and K components of the vector included, all right? Okay, that actually concludes today's lecture. Um, let me just wrap up by <clears throat> noting we've got um, homework seven posted due Thursday before class. Emma and I will both hold our regular office hours tomorrow. And with that, um, I'll stick around and answer any questions if anybody has them. But otherwise, I hope you have a great day and we'll see you um, on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay, I'm going to do one thing real quick before I answer any questions. I just want to save save this um, with a different version so I can keep all my notes on there. Mm -hmm. Terrific. All right, is anybody, oh, I guess I could stop sharing to make this a little easier. So, Okay. Anybody have any questions? I had a question about the um, the Reef app. Yeah, um, I've, oh, I forgot to mention that at the beginning of class. I got like three emails yesterday um, that there have been some challenges with it. Um, Ethan, what what are the problems you're having? So um, I don't know, but since like you like have the graded kind of parts now, um, it's not giving you any points for like if you got it wrong, but uh, I, that was fine. But I'm just saying if you wanted to get like, you're grinding it off participation. Yep. How so, so, all, if you, so if you get it wrong, it. we don't care. We're just, we're just looking to see if you um, responded. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So don't worry about accuracy on it. Uh, well, I mean, we want the accuracy of like, uh, what I'm worried about yeah, is, yeah. Is, is that some people are saying that they're not actually being um, acknowledge that they're that they're in and not being acknowledged. So, um, uh, are, are you are you actually seeing that your your uh, responses are being registered? Yeah, yeah, it's it's all good on that front. It's just like uh, like one of those days, like I had I answered one of them right and one of them wrong, and it like brought my average all the way down. So I was like, oh yeah, don't nuts. okay, don't don't worry about that. Yeah, yeah, don't um yeah, we're not using those to grade with. Um, I, maybe that was. I didn't quite understand everybody's um, message with, that they sent me. I'm more worried about it. Not I'm having a problem with everybody thinks grades getting synced inside the um, the software, which is a bigger issue. So, um, yeah. Yeah. so no worries about it. As long as you had an attempt, that's what's important. All right, sounds good. Thank you. You bet. Take care. Anyone else? I see lots of names. Hey, my question. Um, I have a really quick question about the acceleration. So, the overall acceleration is that acceleration um, equation that you wrote down where it's like the partial of V with respect to T plus U, um, the partial of V with respect to X plus V with the partial of V with respect to Y. That's the overall acceleration equation, but then you broke it down into the separate like acceleration components if you wanted to find X, Y, or Z. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, sorry, maybe I didn't make that clear. So, the overall was the one that we wrote on the bottom of yeah. the first slide, and that that convective versus local is the key for whether time is included or not. So, imagine, for example, that very last three dimensional um, um, velocity that we showed. You know, if all, all of this, the, there was a, the x squared, y squared, z squared in that vector notation meant that if, as I moved forward, so to speak, um, in the x, y, or z direction, I'm going to accelerate. My velocity has to increase. Mm -hmm. But I don't include time in that. It's only a spatial construct. Oh, okay. That's, oh. How, that's how the convective part of that works. Okay. Cool, cool. Okay. That makes sense? 
much. Yeah, thank you. Great, you bet. Catherine. Hi. Um, so I'm the student, one, or one of the students that reached out about the SPUR program over the summer. Oh, okay, <laughs> thanks. Did, did I reply yeah. to you? <laughs> um, the first time, <laughs> yes, the second. Oh, no, um, I was thinking, what was that? Sorry. No, no, you froze there for a second. Oh. The second time something, so. Okay, so the, the second time, no, for my okay. second email. But um, I was thinking if it, because I know you're probably very busy, we could, I'm like going to apply and everything. So we could chat about it whenever, like even after the application deadline. So I had a, um, I had a, a um, my next meeting actually get canceled today. Um, how about, are you available in say 15, 20 minutes if I send you an email with a Zoom link? Um, yes, I, I am actually. Okay, yeah. okay cool. I, I know I need to talk to somebody else before that, but let me send you a link with a, um, my personal Zoom, whatever, yeah. Zoom room link and, mm -hmm. and we can chat then. Okay, that'd be awesome. Okay, terrific. Thank you so Thanks. much. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Anyone else? Someone else can jump forward. Um, I just had a quick question. What uh, will we be doing in this course with the local acceleration? Um, the local acceleration. So one of the things we didn't talk about today is the perspective of whether we are looking, we are trying to do a framework that is Eulerian or Lagrangian. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, an Eulerian perspective, I, I liked it. So Euler was actually... A